Well, safety concerns are rising in our nation's capital for figures in the political world uh, following two frightening incidents. This week, we learned about how one man recently slipped past Secret Service agents and entered the home of National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. And within 24 hours came word of a man accused of attacking two of Democratic Virginia Congressman Jerry Connolly's staffers with a metal baseball bat. Witnesses say the suspect was calling for the congressman who was not at his office at the time. Now, these two events are the fourth and fifth incidents since the assault on the Capitol back on January 6, 2021. And they are part of an incredibly disturbing trend over the last five years. According to the U.S. Capitol Police, which protects members of Congress, threats against House members have jumped from 3,939 in 2017 to 9,625 in 2021. Congressman Fred Upton of Michigan last year said he would not seek re-election in part because of the rise and of threats and expressed concern that these threats will stop qualified people from running. So we wanted to explore the impact that these threats are having. Uh, so we're joined by Rena Shaw, the CEO of Relax Strategies and a GOP strategist who has served on two Republican congressional staffs. Uh, Rena, always good to see you and thanks for joining us. So when things like this happen, and, and, and we mentioned the numbers there, um, what kind of impact does this have on the entire profession of public servants? I, I doubt people are lining up, raising their hand, saying, pick me next, because this is exactly what I want to happen. Um, so what, what, what does this do the, to the profession? Well, good morning to you all. To understand the impact of the, the political violence we're seeing, the increasing number of politically violent incidents, whether they be on sitting elected officials or their representatives or staff members, in other words, uh, we have to draw a direct line to the trend of this era. And it's an all or nothing era of politics. And I think in, in general, what we can take away from the rise of these incidents is that something ought to be done uh, by law enforcement agencies and, and, and also by our judicial system. Do we need to persecute these crimes uh, at, a, at a at a more sort of impactful manner I and mean, the sentencing when we talk about people who are either coming into public spaces with weapons seeking to harm uh, duly elected officials then we have to to distinguish those from just regular everyday hate crimes. I think we haven't yet seen that public conversation. This is really a modern problem of how we tackle the people that feel it's too um, too simple and too easy to go to the most violent extreme. And I, I am really concerned as a person that again, as you introduced me, has served on two congressional staffs at the highest level. As a senior staffer, you're intimately familiar with what threats your member of Congress is facing. And now we see these threats even in state houses in local city uh, officials um in their chambers and of course judges have been facing threats for years and years where people are unhappy with uh, an outcome of a case and so we have a really complex problem here and it's going to take a multi-pronged effort to, to really uh tackle it the way it needs to be handled and there was an extraordinary uh, number out there. U.S. Capitol Police said last month the number of threats against Congress increased 400 percent in the past six years, just to kind of frame the conversation. But in terms of what prompted or uh, what made headlines this way, just a, a little bit of caveats here, and I'm going to figure out if it matters or not. Uh, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, hugely important job <laughs> when it comes to the presidency. Hey. That guy was apparently uh, the intruder, uh, according to reports, was drunk, wandered in, Sullivan confronted him, and then the guy just left. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, I, the question there for me was, how did the Secret Service, which this guy, you know, has Secret Service protection, what was going on that you couldn't stop a drunk guy from getting into uh, that guy's house? And then in terms of uh, Congressman Connolly in Virginia, you know, that guy apparently had a real mental breakdown. There was a video of him swinging a bat at, at a neighbor mm -hmm. before going to the building. So it wasn't necessarily he woke up the day and said, you know, I'm going to, you know, go to Congressman Connolly and, and beat him with this bat. So th these, these latest two incidents are frightening, but there's more than, you know, this is not necessarily a parallel to the Pelosi attack or someone, the person who got arrested outside of Brett Kavanaugh's house who mm -hmm. drove there admittedly to kill the justice. Okay. Um, but scary nonetheless. Um, just want to throw some caveats in there. We don't want yeah. to lump everything together. Nuance is important. Sure. Um, but, uh, and also, yeah. let's talk about the DA here in Georgia, who now is putting a security apparatus together. Because let's face it, before the end of summer, she's going to indict Donald Trump and a bunch of others for election interference. All that is coming. Um, but I'm wondering, from your perspective, why have things ratcheted it up? 
ratcheted up so much so in the last six years. Why that particular span of time in our history, do you think? Well, I think it's very easy to say it's hyperpartisanship on display, right? But that's too easy because we know that in the era of former President Donald Trump, he routinely incited violence um, in, in sometimes indirect language, sometimes indirect language. And and look, you don't have to be a, a Trump uh, hater, uh, as he would say, you know, as, as somebody that didn't like him to have this sense that something wasn't right there or something that you know a person who's entrusted to be the commander in chief so again the person who's in charge of our armed forces uh can can routinely take to a podium and say these are the people who hate me let's demonize them so very quickly we saw that line be drawn from just angry um violent rhetoric that turned to action and i think one thing that january 6 2021 taught us is that anything is possible here that the threat can be from within. It can be domestic. And it doesn't have to be foreigners bombing our buildings to say we don't like America. There are many Americans who are also former military and former law enforcement who don't love America anymore. And they think it's all right to take up arms because they see it enshrined in the Constitution. So you see some very elementary arguments at play when you hear the plane speak from these people that are being charged. Let's not forget, hundreds of people have been charged now um, under the force of the law, uh, full weight of the law, excuse me, uh, for their actions on January 6th, which was t trying to take over our government, to overthrow it and to break into places where simply they should not be, which was a U.S. Capitol grounds. So one thing I think we ought to do is, is really push back as individuals on normalizing angry, violent rhetoric that comes from our elected leaders. I, for one, uh, have, have started to do that. And it doesn't matter what somebody's partisan stripes are. It doesn't matter if you're an R or a D or if you're independent. We got ought to decry that uh, at every turn we can. We got to say to people, this is not normal. Let's not listen to this kind of person. And we got to take our power to the ballot box. If we feel that somebody isn't doing something right, for example, there's a congressman from Louisiana. There's footage from just yesterday on the U.S. Capitol grounds of him pushing a protester, charging him. Then those constituents need to say, what's wrong with this picture? We shouldn't let a, a, an elected member of Congress uh, take on a, a person who's just exercising their First Amendment right. So, so this, I'm really trying to give these vignettes here to say we ought to be vigilant. We ought to pay attention. We ought to exercise our power and our voices to push back on this increasing political violence. Because clearly it's coming from the top down. And we live in a time where that political violence isn't necessarily a deal breaker to some constituents out there because they live in such desperate times of every vote matters. This is every, everything matters right now. So this may not be what as detrimental as it should be. Listen, at the end of the day, Rena, I hear your I hear your points. I think we all, most of us, rational people, would enjoy a more civil country regardless of your political beliefs. But. We just heard Donald Trump say, yeah, I pardon most of the insurrectionists. Right. And at one of his rallies, he right. had a choir, a literal choir of insurrectionists sing the national anthem. So we can push back, but the front runner for the GOP is in many ways endorsing and standing by the violence and those who committed it. And that's a very hard image and level of rhetoric for anyone to combat. Again, the front runner sure. who could very well be the president again. That's another debate. For now, we'll leave it there. Rena, always appreciate your time and your insight. Yep, Thank you so much. You.